Right, so immigration. Yes. Obviously, it's dominating every day for months and months and months. There are so many facets of it. Yeah. You called Congress pathetic, wretched. Yeah. House doesn't want to give Trump a win. Yeah. Senate's not doing anything. Yeah. When we're talking about the detention centers, you yeah. yourself have said, not enough funding. In that crisis, what are, we, what are the American people, what are you going to do about it? I mean, how is this ever going to come to a resolution it's, when nothing is happening? It's not going to come to a resolution until we do a couple of things. Number one is we have got to get funding for beds, for Border Patrol, for ICE, and for HHS. I mean, there simply is not, there's no space. I and mean, we've got these kids, for instance. And by the way, the cartels and the smuggling rings. It's a for-profit business for them now. So what are they doing? They're going and exploiting vulnerable families in the Northern Triangle area, Central America, and they're telling them, oh, if you'll pay us seven, $8,000, we'll guarantee you safe passage to the United States. Well, they can't do that. They know they can't do that, but the families don't know. So what do they do? They, 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 give, they mortgage their house, they sell everything they own, they pay them, and then they take them to the border, they make them cross the border, and, and then they leave them there. And that includes a lot of kids. And then the smuggling rings have developed child smuggling rings where they're selling children for 84 bucks a kid so that these, these people, these smugglers, can come in and bring a kid and say, oh, look, we're claiming asylum. We have a child. Let us into the interior of the country. It's the worst kind of exploitation. So we've got to change the asylum system. We've got to allow people to apply for asylum in their own country so they don't come to the border in the first place. We've got to put up a physical barrier in the places where it's needed so that we can stop the crossings. And we also need to put more immigration judges so we can speed along the asylum process. The truth is the cartels and the smugglers are abusing the asylum process deliberately to make money, and they're endangering families and kids in the process. And that's a plan for a long process. But when you're talking about kids drinking toilet water in these detention facilities yeah. today. With nowhere to sleep. So yeah. funding. That's something that can be done now and be right. So and what, just, what's going to happen with that? For, fortunately, the Senate and the House finally, the House Democrat leadership finally caved and said, okay, fine, we'll pass some funding for Border Patrol and ICE and HHS so that we can actually give these kids safe and sanitary and humane conditions. So I think it was $4 billion. That's a start. But there needs to be more so that the Border Patrol can do their job. Do you know that about 40% of Border Patrol agents now down on the border are not actually at their stations? They're just trying to care for the children and the families. They're not trained to do that. They're not funded to do that. They don't have space to do that. It's out of control. So Congress has got to step up, actually fund these agencies, make the changes in the law. And I said, if they're not going to do that, then I'm afraid the president is going to have to use whatever legal authority he can because we, we cannot go on like this. And by the way, the amount of drugs coming into our state from across the board, fentanyl, heroin, methamphetamines, it's got to stop. Obviously, you clerked for Chief Justice Roberts. He will be the deciding vote if there is a possible reversal of Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. How do you think he'll handle that? I have no idea. I have, what I've learned about the Supreme Court, I've worked there, I've litigated there. You can never predict what they're going to do. And their recent cases show that. Uh, you know, I mean, there's some, been some real surprises this term, like that census case, for instance, which I think was wrongly decided. So I have no idea what the courts will do on, uh, on Roe, and I think it may take a while to get there. My guess is we'll see a lot of different cases tested in different courts across the country. I'd be surprised if the Supreme Court took up any of those cases for some time. But who knows? With the United States Supreme Court, you never know. Do you think he'll take more of a middle ground? I have, I honestly, really? I have no idea. Some of it will depend on what kind of question comes to the court. I mean, what, what, is, what is the law at issue? Is it something that expands uh, a waiting time? Is it something that requires additional consent? Is it health and safety regulations? I mean, it, it will really depend. All of those cases are percolating through the system. There's lots of lawsuits now. So like that on so many other questions, whether it's immigration, uh, whether it's uh, the president's foreign affairs power, I mean, it's going to have to work its way through the system. The Planned Parenthood issue here, obviously, as a former law professor, what are your thoughts on what's happening there? Well, I mean, the, the administrative procedure hearing is coming in August. I mean, they're going through the right channels. There's a, there's a process for this when you have a license denied and state law sets it out, so the right channels are being followed. But I, I would just say this. I mean, I think the Planned Parenthood clinic could cut all of this short by just complying with the health and safety regulations. I mean, do you understand why they don't want to? Oh, well, I'm, I'm sure that, well, actually, I, I have to say, I'm not sure I do understand why they don't want to. I mean, I hope that it's not because the facilities really are unsafe, because what I understand is 
Their license was denied because of multiple failed abortions that resulted in significant health uh, danger to women. So I hope that they're willing to comply with health and safety regulations, and this isn't about running an unsafe facility. So surely they should be willing and able to meet health and safety regulations. And if they want that clinic to be up and running, then work with the regulators and get it up and running. But that's what they ought to do here, comply with the law, make it safe, and then there wouldn't have to be a hearing. Well, I think they feel the goalposts are changing in this second exam. So they, they so they say. I mean, look, my, my, my advice is uh, comply with the health and safety regulations. Women should be able to know that any medical facility, any medical facility, whether it's an outpatient facility or a Planned Parenthood clinic, that it is safe that it is supervised by the relevant health officials in the state. I mean, every Missourian ought to be able to bank on that. Obviously, you watched the debates last week. I did. If you Some of them, I should say. If, you, ha- all of it. if you had to choose, <laughs> if you have to choose one Democratic candidate yeah. that is the biggest threat to the GOP in 2020 as of now, oh, yeah. who is that? Oh, gosh, I don't know the answer to that question. I d- what I was struck by in the debates, and I, I, I watched a little of both debates, but honestly, I couldn't, I, I couldn't make it through both of them all the way. I was just struck by how far left and how out of touch that party has become. This is a party that used to take pride in standing up for workers, for instance. I didn't hear anything about supporting American workers. I didn't hear anything about getting real wages growing. What I heard was a lot of talk about little niche issues that only the Democrat Party cares about, uh, talking about who, who can pander to the base, and, and then, of course, attacking the president in the most virulent terms. I didn't hear a lot of solutions. I didn't hear a lot of talk about working families. Uh, I think they're out of touch with the center of America. So you wouldn't pick any as a threat? I don't, look, I mean, I think it'll be a close and tough election because I think that uh, the media is very much against this president. I think that uh, that there's going to be, Democrat voters will be very energized. And that this is an iconoclast president who has challenged a lot of old orthodoxies. And there's, you know, let me tell you, from having spent six months in Washington, the establishment hates him. Not just the Democrat establishment, the entire party establishment detests Donald Trump. So, yeah, it's going to be a hard-fought election because they don't like that. But uh, I think he's going to win. You like Donald Trump. I do. I do. And I take pride in not being part of the establishment. You know, in my short six months in the Senate, I have been attacked repeatedly by the party establishment, including my own party establishment, for going after big corporations, for going after big pharma, for going after big tech, uh, for saying that I'm only going to vote for pro-Constitution judges. And uh, you know what? I take some pride in that because I said I wasn't going to Washington to be part of any establishment. I was going to stand up for the people of Missouri and be an independent voice. So I figure if I'm getting attacked, even from my own establishment, I'm probably doing the right thing. Let's talk about the big tech thing. You have so many irons in the fire. There's no way I can touch on all of them today. But what is, of all the bills, what's the most important to you? If you had to pick one that's actually going to make it through. I I think the overall picture is we've got to hold these tech companies accountable. We've got to protect our kids. I'm a parent. I've got two little boys at home, my wife and I do. We worry to death what our kids are seeing online, but also the information these companies want to collect from our children and build them into a profile and then track them and try to sell them stuff for the rest of their lives. So my view is every parent, every Missouri parent, ought to be able to say, I don't want you to track my kids and I want you to give their information back. I don't want you keeping a dossier on my children. So I've introduced legislation that would do that, that would give every Missourian the right to say, I don't want to be tracked either. I should be able to get on the internet and use it without these companies following me around and tracking what I buy and what news I'm reading and what sports I'm watching. So I've introduced legislation to do all of that and to hold them accountable. Reparations Committee. What is your stance on reparations from a moral perspective? You know, I think the best thing that we can do as a society for those who are hurting, whether it's those who are hurting in the urban core, whether it's those who are hurting in rural America, in rural Missouri, or in our suburbs, is work to get people good paying jobs that will support a family, get real wages rising, and give people an opportunity to actually own something and have a stake in this country. And here's the thing I see about our economy today, is that for too long, we've had these mega corporations who have lots of profits, they don't reinvest them in our communities, they don't bring good jobs back here, and too many people say, I don't feel like I have any stake in this country. I don't feel like I have anything that belongs to me. That has got to change. That's why Donald Trump got elected president. It's got to change. So it sounds like if 
legislation is recommended by the committee, you would probably not be for it. You know, I, I, I doubt it. I mean, I have to see what they, I, I would need to see a specific proposal, but I think we need to be looking forward rather than back. We've got a lot of problems to address, and there are a lot of folks in this country who deserve to have a stake, who deserve to have a share, who deserve to have a good-paying job, and that's people right here in the state of Missouri. And you know what? Those people, a lot of those people sent me to Washington to go fight for that stuff, and that's what I'm going to do. The Nike thing, of course, I have to ask yeah. you because that is news of the day. Yeah. Um, St. Louis Post is badge. A couple of different places have picked up you on your tweet. Yeah. You've sent out a press release about it. You've got some strong words for Nike. Yeah, I do. Why did this get under your skin so well, look, bad? You know, if Nike thinks that putting the American flag on a shoe is offensive, they ought to look in the mirror. I tell you what's offensive is them shipping jobs overseas and paying sweatshop labor prices. What's offensive is them partnering with the repressive communist Chinese government, who, by the way, basically tells Nike what shoes they can and cannot sell in China. The Chinese government recently got Nike to pull a shoe product because they didn't like the connection to a pro-democracy activist. And by the way, how much does Nike pay in tax in the United States of America? I bet it's, I'm willing to bet it's close to zero. That's what's offensive. So here's what they ought to do. They ought to apologize to the American people for denigrating the flag. They ought to apologize to every Missourian who has lost a family member defending our flag. And they ought to restart production of that Betsy Ross shoe line right here in St. Louis in the St. Charles facility. What's your response to the people that are critical of the shoe that say it has ties to slavery, that that, that flag has ties to slavery? I think a flag that a founding mother, Betsy Ross, designed, whose story, by the way, is a great story. Her story ought to be told and taught in every school in the state and in this country. We ought to be celebrating her. We ought to be celebrating her contribution to American history. We ought to be celebrating what brings us together. And the flag and our history together as a country and her particular and unique history as a founding mother in this country, that ought to be celebrated. That's something we can share in common. Back to the Democratic debate, something that they kept bringing up was the Medicare for all. Yeah. Is there going to be a place for private insurance companies going forward? Uh, there needs to be because, listen, I mean, what we cannot do is take away the insurance that most Americans get through their employers. I mean, this is, I'm listening to the Democrats, and they're talking about, this is what I was talking about earlier with these niche issues. I mean, so health is not a niche issue. Health is a huge issue. But to say that they want to take away the private health insurance that Americans get from their employers, I mean, that's unbelievable. I mean, just unbelievable. And then to say that they'll go out and make Medicare pay for all of it, that will bankrupt Medicare. So right there, you've just taken away people's private insurance and you've committed us to bankrupting Medicare. I tell you what, I will never support bankrupting Medicare and I will never support taking away the insurance that works for folks. We need to take on Big Pharma, and I've introduced legislation to do that. We need to get prescription drug prices down and we need to get insurance costs down. But taking away people's insurance and making Medicare the sacrificial lamb for that is crazy. It's just crazy. Congress has been, I mean, Senator McCaskill, former Senator McCaskill, she tried to get big pharma and prices down yeah. for a long time. It's a lot easier said than done. Yeah. So how will you succeed in it when so many people have not? You've got to be tough. You've got to be willing to stand up to the companies, and that's what I've done. So, so I've introduced a bill that says, very simple, it says that Missourians shouldn't be forced to pay 300 and 400 percent more for the same drugs that somebody in Europe or Canada are paying. So my bill says pharma can negotiate whatever price they want, but they cannot charge us 300 and 400 percent more. They've got to charge us the same price that they're charging Canadians and people from Germany and France and neighbor European country. It's a fairness measure. Uh, it would bring prices down immediately and it would hold big pharma accountable and that's what we need. Your mantra, the American middle. Yeah. What's the number one thing you've done in your very short tenure for them? To take on the, the, the biggest power centers in the country. I mean, to, to stand up to big pharma, to stand up to big tech, to stand up to big companies like Nike, and to say, you know what, our politics for too long has focused on insiders, it's focused on these mega corporations, it's focused on the elites. They're all doing great. All those folks are doing great. They've got lots of represent, representation on Capitol Hill, lots of money. We need people in, on Capitol Hill who are going to go fight for our way of life, going to fight for our jobs, going to fight for our families, and that's what I'm trying to do. So will you not take any money from those big corporations in a campaign? Listen, you know, I've said that people are wel welcome to donate to me who they want. I mean, they because that would be them supporting me. So they can do whatever they want in terms of their contributions. But you can see what my positions are. So if folks think that they're going to influence me 
by their contributions, think again. And I think my first six months ought to make that pretty clear. All right. Anything else you'd like to add or touch on? I don't think so. Okay. I'm good.